Praise the Lord. I greet you once again all in the precious name of Jesus. And I have an exciting message and a challenging message to give to us today, especially because it's, it's from a time in, in Israel's past, but it's so relevant for today. And it's a message that is preached a lot by a lot of so-called ministers in terms of it being a prosperity message. My topic is called favor and blessings from God. Key part says no genie. You know how you have the genie in the bottle? No genie. Favor and blessings from God. No genie. <laughs> this is what I want to emphasize today when we talk about what everyone loves to hear. That's why a lot of these prosperity preachers speak these messages of favor and of God's blessings and God taking care of you. Everyone loves to hear this because I don't believe that there's anyone that really <laughs> wants anything less than to be blessed and to find favor of God and for you know things to be going okay in their lives. So we love to hear this positivity talk. We love to hear about favor and the blessings from God. But my message is not going to be like a lot of these prosperity messages. It's going to be based on the word of God. And it's going to be based on the truth of God's word and how favor and blessings are applied to our lives. And I have a wonderful text today that's going to bring this out in a realistic form as it relates to their life, as it exposes the lives of the Israelites and how it relates to us today. Praise the Lord. Let me open up in um, um, prayer first before I get too far I'm along. Lord, we thank you, God. Thank you because your presence has been here. God. Lord, thank you, Lord God, that we can feel it, Lord God. And Lord, you have moved by your spirit freely. And I, Father God, give myself to you right now, Lord God, that you will continue to order my steps. And that you would have your way and that, God, your word will come through with demonstration of your power and your presence, Lord God. And that a soul could be saved and that others would be encouraged that in all things you will receive the honor, the glory, and the praise. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have a couple key verses that I want to read first to set the turn for this text. Second Chronicles chapter 35, verse 1 and verse 18. Here we get at the reading of God's holy word. Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. Verse 18 says, and there was no, remember this, no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel, the prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were there, that were present, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Mercy. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verses 1 to 4. And the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear ye. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye of Judah, that enter in at the gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, a man your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Mercy. Lastly, John 15 and 7, Jesus says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. May God add a blessing to the reading of his most holy word. Praise the Lord. I have two points that I'm going to use to bring forward this message today. Point one says, using, God's, using God when it suits us. Point two says, a true relationship with God brings favor. These are the points that I want to use today to bring forward this message. 
This message is meant to be very challenging to all of us. And as I set the turn uh, for this message, I want to give you a little quick historical account of what's been, what's these texts are going to be coming from and how it's going to play out. Jeremiah 7 was read as a main text. In my key verse, I read you 2 Chronicles 35 verse 1, and it talked about this great Passover that King Josiah has, and it's considered one of the best and the most beautiful and powerful Passovers that any king had since the days of Samuel. What I want you to remember and put into context is that when I start to read to you about Jeremiah, what Jeremiah is saying in Jeremiah 7, I want you to understand that they actually go together. Jeremiah was Aaron, specifically Aaron in the days of King Josiah. And he started to first prophesy some of the stuff that was going to happen to Israel. But I want you to get how this stuff is going together. The best and biggest Passover that had been for hundreds of years takes place under King Josiah. Right after that, God tells Jeremiah to go into the temple and to speak what he says in Jeremiah chapter 7. What you've got to remember is the historical accounts of what's going on here. And that's why it's good for us to always know the history of the times that we are dealing with. Josiah is coming to be king after his grandfather, really, was um, king of Israel for almost 55 years. And his grandfather was King Manasseh, arguably the most wickedest and evilest king in the history of Israel. He done some of the most despicable things that had ever been done. So he died. One of the sons was king just for about two years, and, and he got killed. And so Josiah ends up be becoming king when he was only eight years old. But he had a godly mother that helped to prepare him. So Josiah becomes king when he's eight years old. He inherits an Israeli state that is so far away from God. I remember this week, uh, a Friday, um, um, I'm trying to remember which the, the scripture, I think it was in San, no, Judges. It was in Judges. I think it was 2 and 10. Brother Perry had put it in there. That, and there arose a generation that did not know God. So what happens is there have been a few generations that have been growing up on the king Manasseh, who was not serving God, who was living whatever way they wanted to live. King Josiah becomes king at eight years of old, eight years of age. But by the time he is 16, he gives his heart over to God and he seeks to be what God would have him to be. And in doing that, he realizes that the temple is destroyed. And he goes about his way, his way to get this temple rebuilt. And as they go through the temple and start to look around and get stuff to organize themselves to fix the temple up, the priest, Hilkiah, finds one of the books of the Bible. Well, at that time, it was called the Torah. And it was Moses. And they believe it was one of the original ones that Moses had written. And he brought it to Shephan, who was the scribe. And they decided to take it to the king and to read it. And when they did read it, the king realized how far Israel was away from God. How much Israel wasn't following God. And he made up his mind that he was going to fix up that temple. He made up his mind that he was going to get Israel back in a place to worshiping God. One of the beautiful things about this story is that 
when he made up his mind, Josiah made up his mind that he was going to fix up this temple. When he made up his mind, he was going to find out what God would have him to do. He sent Hilkiah and Shaphan and three other guys to go and to seek out what God would have him to do. And I bring this point up because it's very relevant for a, a few reasons. One of my main reasons I like about it is because it highlights how God uses who he will use. The king sent a high priest, a scribe, and three other men, people from the temple, to seek out what God would have them to do. It doesn't tell you this, but you can reasonably infer there was no Ark of the Covenant at place at that time. Normally, whenever they wanted to find out what God wanted to do, they went and the priest would go and pray around the Ark of the Covenant. There was no Ark of the Covenant. It doesn't get into that in terms of articulating that, but you can reasonably infer that because they never went there. They ended up going to this woman. She was a prophetess, Hoda, prophetess Hoda. She was around at that time. But guess who else was around? Sapphaniah was around, Nehom was around, Jeremiah was around, Ezekiel was up and coming. All these great and mighty, powerful men of God. But God sent those other men of God to this prophetess, Hoda, to find out what God's word was. And Hoda gives a prophecy over Josiah and tells him that. The same prophecy that Jeremiah comes along and gives later that that country is going to face King Nebuchadnezzar and that they're all going into captivity. But she makes the prophecy that because Josiah, when he found out how far Israel was away from God, that he took his clothes off him and put on this thing, which is a, which is a way that they show their remorse. He put ashes and sackcloth on himself. And he cried out to God. He was so disgusted and ashamed of the, the state Israel was in. Prophetess Hoda says that because you've done that, Josiah, God said, I'm not going to uh, let you go into captivity. I will let you die before this happens so that you don't get to experience it. But the prophecy is set. So I want you to know that from that point on, there is a prophecy that Israel is going into captivity. They're going to meet up against the Babylonians who was just up and coming and the Egyptians that were still around at that time and the last of the Amorites. So you had these armies that was around Israel, but that they are talking about the weakest one was going to come and get so big, which was the Babylonian army, King Nebuchadnezzar's army was going to get so big and they were going to take over Israel. But the Israelites in Jeremiah 7 are getting caught up because Josiah has got his mind made up on serving God. Josiah has rebuilt the temple and they have the best and the biggest celebration of a Passover that's ever been seen in Israel since the days of Samuel. So you would think everything's beautiful. In the midst of that, we get what we're going to get into tonight in Jeremiah chapter 7. When they are all celebrating, when they're all excited about this temple being rebuilt, about this new Passover just being held, the Israelites are like, well, God, God's favor, everything's beautiful. God sends a message to the people of God. And I come today to bring that message to you. And the challenge is for each of us to look within ourselves because favor and blessings are there for us. But it doesn't work on a genie typeology. It doesn't work on a genie formula. You don't get to rub the bottle three times and make a wish and get what you want from God. Yes, it's blessings. Yes, it's favor there for you as children of God but it doesn't work in a genie way. It's gonna work in a certain way that deals with your relationship with God. And that's what I wanna to highlight to you today. Praise the Lord. Point one, using God when it suits us. So remember this storyline 
as it plugs out, because I'm not going to always refer back to the storyline, but you'll be able to know what's being said as you remember this, this storyline. What are the dynamics behind why Jeremiah's coming forward with what is saying based upon what's already happened? Praise the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. This is what God tells Jeremiah to do after everybody is going to the temple and everybody is excited because it's a new temple being built to, to the Gunder, but that all of them look like the Christians. All of them sound like the serving God. You understand? But God knows what's really going on. So this is what he tells Jeremiah to do. He says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. This is the house that Josiah just fixed up and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, what a man your ways and your doings. And I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want you to understand that that saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, it's like a good luck charm that they were saying. It's like a genie thing. Oh, as long as we're in the temple of the Lord, then whatever we are facing, we are okay. Because the temple of the Lord, we're in the temple of the Lord. So God is telling to Jeremiah, tell them, don't go in my house. Just because you're in my house. And then be acting like, I'm in the temple of the Lord. I'm in the temple of the Lord. Everything's okay. No. The key word he says to them, I'll man your ways, and then I'll let you be in this house as long as you want. It's not about just coming to this house. And you're not going to change what's going on in the inside of you. Because this is what this message is going to be about. It's some favor and some blessings that are waiting for you. Don't get in the way of these favors and blessings by your ways not being amended, by you not seeking God. God can give you the favor and the blessings he would normally bestow on your life. Look at 1 Samuel 15 and 22, because God's not interested in you doing stuff just to say that you are done it. 1 Samuel 15 and 22 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey, hallelujah, is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. What is your true motivation, saints? Hmm? What is your true motivation in going to church? God knows exactly what your motivation is. I'm not here to go down that road of trying to question why you're there. You need to know it for yourself. Those gods were going to church just because that was the end thing. Because the church had just gotten built. It was a brand new church. Everything looked nice. And they were talking about the olden days and all this stuff. But they were going to church. But what you're going to see is, Saturday night, they was doing something else. Monday morning, they was doing something else. You understand? John was being sent to tell these people, listen, don't just come into this house and say, oh, the house of, oh, the temple of God, oh, the temple of God. I'm going to say these abacar, these abacar, Deborah, these, and everything's going to be working out for me. Oh, no. A manual is. Look at Jeremiah chapter, same Jeremiah 7, look at verses 8, and how God starts to reveal where these people's really at. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 8 says, Behold, hmm, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal and murder? It's talking about what these people's doing in their everyday life. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery? And you're going to swear falsely? And you're burning incense unto Baal? And then you're walking out the other gods whom you know not? And then you'll come and then you're going to stand before me in my house, which is called by my name, and say what? We are delivered to do all these abominations. God is delivering you from all what you're facing. You know that it's a prophecy going out. This is what Jeremiah is saying to him. You know it's a prophecy going out that 
Nebuchadnezzar is coming to destroy you. But yet you're in there talking about Hezekiah. When Hezekiah faced that great army and you're comforting yourself with what God done with Hezekiah. So you're saying, what we are doing? You think that God's going to deliver you so you can continue in these abominations? Verse 11 says, in this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye, listen to what he directs them. Go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Let me just read this 2 Timothy 3 and 5, and then I'm going to go and break this down for you even further. But 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. I want you to know that we can have a form of godliness, okay? yet God knows our real heart. These guys were coming into his house with all the forms of godliness. They were dressing like saints. It was sounding like saints in the church. How can we expect his favor or blessings in our times of need if we're not really living right with God? God tells them, listen, go back to Shiloh. If you think that you can just do what you like, and I'm not going to react, go back to Shiloh and see where the Ark of the Covenant used to be where people used to come and worship, where I used to dwell. But when these people that was in Shiloh stopped worshiping me, go to out of Shiloh and you'll find that nothing's done all. I'm not in that place. I destroyed that place because people were coming there but not being serious about their walk with me. God tells Jeremiah, go down to that church, to that brand new temple they just built where everybody's down there excited and thinking that they've got the favor of God when they've been prophesied that they've got animus coming out against them. And then I worried about the animus. They've got a false. He said, you're trusting in lying words. You're trusting in a false security. Don't bring up about what God done with Hezekiah. Because what God done with Hezekiah was based on Hezekiah's relationship with him. It was based on Hezekiah bringing himself to a place. Don't bring up Job has a fact. When these kings received glory and blessings and victories and favor from God because they brought the people around to a place to worship God. But go back and see what happened in Shiloh when they weren't worshiping me and what I done. These were people who are serving God when it suits them. They're under some problems. They've got some dreads of King Nebuchadnezzar coming their way. So they are taking the position that, listen, well, look, we're going to be like Jehoshaphat. We're going to be like King Hezekiah. And, you know, this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. None of those foreign people can touch us. They can't hurt us. We're going to walk in favor. We're going to walk in victory. I declare victory. I declare all types of stuff. God is telling Jeremiah, don't trust. Tell them, I'm trusting them lying words. Because if you're not living right, if you don't amend your ways, you think I'm going to deliver you so that you can continue to wash up false gods, so that you can continue to do sinning? This is what this whole Jeremiah 7 is about. That God is not here to bless you, to bring victory into your life so that you can continue in foolishness. But if you would seek him, like Hezekiah did, if you would be serious about your relationship with him, God can do something. He said, I'll make you dwell in this place forever. If not, you can go back and look at what I done to Shiloh. This is people who have got the form of godliness. They know how to talk about God. But God is interested in your walk. God is interested in your everyday relationship with him. It's not worrying about you being like some other Christian over there. It's worrying about you giving your all to him. You being sincere from who you are and God working with it. God wants to use what you got 
but we can't come to him and expect blessings in our lives and expect favor in our lives so that we can continue living our best life in the world. Our best life is always going to be us surrendering ourselves over to God and finding out how God's leading us into this walk. But these people wanted blessings from God to continue to live in a way that wasn't serving God. Let's look at point number two. Because point number two is what we want to make sure that we are always striving for. A true relationship with God brings favor. Yes, we want to hear this prosperity gospel. Yes, we want to hear that we are going to be okay. Yes, we want to hear that we're going to live in victory. Yes, we want to hear that God is pleased with our lives. But it's going to always come from us having a relationship with God. It's not some abracadabra. It's not someone falling on my knees in a time of need when there's pressure on my back, when there's trials and tribulations all around me, when there's persecution, and I abracadabra God, in Jesus' name, take it all away. No, no. This is what these Israelites are thinking at that time. And Jeremiah's been to go down and tell them it's not an abracadabra situation. If you change your ways, if you focus on serving me, then I'll make you dwell in this place. Same way Hezekiah did, same way Jehoshaphat did, the same way did King David, these guys had victory over the, their prosecutions. But if you don't amend your ways, if you don't change, I'm not going to bless you so you can keep following idols. I'm not going to bless you so you can keep going your own way. I'm going to treat you like Shiloh. Go and check out Shiloh. Shiloh is empty. I no longer abide there. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 13 to 16. God continued to use Jeremiah. He says, and now, because ye have done all these things, these works, all this abomination stuff, saith the Lord, and I speak unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and called you, but you answered not. It's God is saying to, to the Israelites, he said, I've been calling you. I've been reaching out to you. I've been whispering in your ear. I've been convicting you of what you need to stop doing. But you answered not. Verse 14 says, Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you have got trust. you have got this abracadabra trust that because you're in the house of God, that you're going to get away from all these problems. And unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I done to Shiloh. I'm going to do the same thing. Listen to what Jeremiah is telling these people that God is saying. I'm going to make this great temple that you're living in now that's just been fixed up and looking all sharp. I'm going to make it like Shiloh. I'm going to do unto it as I done unto Shiloh. Verse 15 says, and I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Now, when you see this Ephraim, you know that's uh, on one of the tribes, but it's not speaking directly of a tribe because in, in, in this context, Ephraim is, come, is, is being used as an idiom of the northern Israel. And at this time, the northern Israel had already been overtaken by the Assyrians. So all the northern Israel, Israelites had been destroyed, but they always refer to that area as the, the area of Ephraim. Uh, verse 16 says, therefore, pray, he tells, this is the what he tells Jeremiah. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. All this is coming from a direct response that God says in verse 13, that I called you early in the morning, you was rising up, and I called out to you, and you heard me not, and you answered me not. Therefore, this place is going to get destroyed. And don't waste your time, Jeremiah, praying for them. Because what God is saying is that these people have rejected me. And if you continue to go in your own way, Romans 1 tells you that God gets tired and he judges. And I'm saying to you today, saints, that God is looking for your best. He's looking for your sincerity. He's not looking for you to be like some other great Christian leader that you might have in your mind. He's looking for you to be honest about where you're at 
and what you can give to him. The songwriter says, give of your best to the master. Not give of what someone else is giving. Give of your true best. And God can work with you. God can do something in your life. Mercy. Let us look at Jeremiah chapter, same seven, verses 17 to 19. And see what God is continuing to re reveal to Jeremiah about Israel's state and how he feels about them. Verse 17 says, See is thou not what they do in the cities of Judah? Remember, these are people that are going to the temple now and acting like they've got some great relationship going to God. They'll say, oh, oh, the temple of God. Oh, the temple of God. We ain't worrying about what those guys say they're going to do to us. We have the temple of God. And we're going to be like Hezekiah. We're going to be like these other great men of war. Jeremiah says, seest thou not what they do in these in the cities of Judah? Yes, they're going to church and act in one way. But look at what they're doing in the cities of Judah. And look at what they're doing in the streets of Jerusalem. Look at what, and then he, just, he tells you what's going on. The children gather wood, and the fathers are kindling the fire. Huh? And the women need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, Astra. This goddess that they worship, that still gets worshipped. They just changed the um, name around. And, but at this time, the corner. And still to this day, some of them call her the queen of heaven. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods. So though they're in church Sunday acting like this, or on the Sabbath day acting like this, and, and, and I'm doing that, God is revealing to Jeremiah that this is what they're doing. The whole family's involved. The children are going out getting the wood. The husband's starting the fire. And the woman's knitting the dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. And then they are pouring out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Whoa, this is God talking here. God said, thou provoking me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger? <laughs> Said the Lord, do they not provoke themselves to confusion uh, of their own faces? Our actions, hallelujah, reflects our real relationship with God. Our relationship that we have with God directly affects how our blessings and how the favor comes into our lives. But our true actions is the real proof of what our relationship is. 17 to 19 is saying, listen, y'all are coming in church and uh, saying all the stuff, trusting in lying words, but during the week, but got the children doing and getting reward. Every, their whole family is only given over to worshiping idols. They're not worshiping me. Saints, what is the challenge today? God wants your all. And all week I've had to wrestle with this. All week I have to continuously question where I'm at, what's really important in my life, how much more I need to surrender over to God. This is the reality of our walk with God. This is what God wants for us. God don't want us to be some tiny Christians. God don't want us to call on his name like it's some genie and you're just calling and then whatever you need is just going to happen. God is looking for people who are in a consistent relationship with him. Saints, this is the challenge each of us has to live with. Those Israelites are going to the temple, dressing all up, looking all sharp. But in their hearts, they're still doing their own stuff. When they go back out, look at, he says, look at what they're doing in the temple. Look at what they're doing when they leave the temple. But when they go to the streets and how the, the children's getting this and the husband's getting that and the wife's making this, they're still seeking after other gods. If we want favor from God, it's not going to happen in a genie experience. It's not going to be rubbing something and saying some names and just getting what you want. It's going to come from you living a certain life with God. Look at Psalms 51 and you'll get an idea of what God's looking for. Psalms chapter 51 and, and, and verse 17. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou would not despise. God is looking for people who are sincere. We spoke earlier in 1 Samuel 15, 22. God is not interested in your sacrifices. 
He wants obedience first. Because there are people who can do some stuff and make them look and sound like they're on the right track. They've got the form of godliness. But obedience is always going to be better than sacrifice. God looks at your heart, saints. He don't want you to worry about being like that person, being like that person, or me being like that person. He wants you to be sincere in your heart. You be you. You are very unique. And God has a plan for you. He wants you to give your all to him. Give up your best to your master. Give up the, the strength of your youth. And God can do something with you. A broken and a contrite spirit. A uh, um, con, con, contrite spirit. A spirit that is humble. That is humbly just seeking God to do something. Lord, have your way with my life, God. No one else before you, God. Help me to serve you like I should. Help me in all my weaknesses, God, to put you first in my life. God knows what your struggles are. God knows what your temptations are. God will deliver you out of them all. But just give up your best to him. Look at John chapter 15 and 7. Sounds like a remedy for a genie. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. What? This is what I'm going to do. If I abide in him, his words abide in me. I can ask what I want and it's going to be. This can do it. Understand scripture. You have to do the first part. The first part is to abide in me, Jesus said. If you abide in me and my words are really abiding in you, you will ask what you want. What you're going to find out is that what you want changes. <laughs> it changes. What I want when I'm not saved. It's different. What I want when I am saved is different. What I want as I grow in God changes from what I want to what God's will is. So it's when I ask what I will, it's a process. It's not just some Africa that's going to happen. It's based on me abiding in God and God's word abiding in me. And then I'm going to be seeking God's will. It's not going to be about me being Africa that to get whatever I want, whatever favor and blessings I think is, is necessary for me. Because I'm in tune with God, my desires change, my wants change. And so when I pray, my prayers are different. Paul said, I did not come to declare unto you the whole gospel of God. You can't just take one scripture and say, whatever you ask in my name, it's going to be done. No, you need to understand if you abide in me and my words abiding in you, you're going to ask what you will. And it, it can be done unto you because what you're asking is going to be based on God's will because you're abiding in God. It's not some abracadabra stuff. It's based on a relationship that is sincere with God. Acts chapter 27. This is how favor shows up in your life. Favor shows up in your life, not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of God and you abiding in him. Verse 21, we spoke of this last week, chapter 27, verse 21. But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of a good, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. And then he goes on to say, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whom I, whose I am and whom I serve. I'm abiding in him and his words are, are abiding in me. So now this angel comes saying to me, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. This is how favor shows up in your life. Favor shows up in your life, not in the absence of problems, not in the absence of trials and tribulations, but always the presence of God's will still being able to be carried out. Paul said, this God, whose I am and whom I serve, has sent an angel to be by my side in the midst of this storm and has assured me to tell you guys, don't fear, all I'm just going to make it. You're going to benefit because of my favor with God. This is how God's favor shows up. Our love for God is seen in our obedience to his words. 
This is what brings blessings and favor in your life. Not abracadabra, not just coming to church and, and looking and, and sounding good. It's directly related to your obedience to God's word. Paul said, this God, whose I am and whom I serve, this is what's bringing the blessings in my life. This is what's bringing the favor in my life. Saints, yes, you're going to face some trials and tribulations. Don't worry about it. Paul is in the middle of being three or four days without a sun, without a moon, without a stars, without any idea of where he's going, floating around. And then he gets up and tells these guys to serve. Don't panic. I know you're old and terrified and fainting over these last three days, but the God whom I serve, the God who I am obedient to, has assured me that we're all going to make it all right. And later on, we see that that's exactly what happens. Saints, this is how favor shows up in your life. I don't know this other gospel that's being preached out there by a lot of, of these other ministers that if you're saved and if you're serving God and if you're paying your tithes and uh, come to church, you're not got no problems. You're not going to get sick. You're going to be rich. You're going to be well off. You're not going to have no problems. This is not what scripture says. Scripture says to abide in God's word. And whatever you face, God will bring you through it. Trust not in lying words. Lastly, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, listen to this, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I speak not unto your fathers, I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Understand what's being said here. God is making a point to the Israelites that when he brought this, their fathers out of the land of Egypt, he didn't command them to do these burnt offerings and sacrifices. Verse 23 says, but this one thing I commanded, I am saying, obey my voice, saints. Hallelujah. Obey my voice. And I will be your God. And ye shall be my people. And you will walk in all the ways that I have commanded you. That it may be wow. Hallelujah. That it, you may have success. That you may have favor. That you may have blessings. That it may be wow unto you. He's saying that, listen, not that I never told you that, but what the first thing I did tell you when you came out of the land wasn't for you to do burnt sacrifices, but was that you would be obedient. The burnt sacrifices and, and all that ordinance came later. But what I first asked of you was that you would obey my voice and that you would be my people, and that it may go well with you. Hallelujah. John 14, verse 13 to 15. Well known, Jesus says, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. This is how you get favor, saints. God is no genie. He's not saying, come and pay some tithes in church and you'll get whatever you want. He's not saying, come to church. And do this, sir. God is no genie who appears just when you want him to. No, thanks. God has a plan for your life. You are required to act in a certain way. If you want God to be present in your life, you have to be present in your walk with God. There's no genie that's just going to appear. When you've got a circumstance, when you find yourself in what you may deem to be some form of crisis. Yes, he may, and I'm going to emphasize this, sir, he may be merciful and help you out of that situation. But there's not no genie that owes you anything. God doesn't appear just when we want him to, nor will our religious efforts and our sacrifices summons him. God wants an everyday sense. And this is the challenge that I continue to give with myself. God wants a everyday intimate relationship with you. 
It's a sacrifice. Paul said, the God of whom I am and whom I serve, that's the God that's moving on my behalf. I am abiding in him and he is abiding in me. God is saying to all these that are going to church today, trust not in lying words. If you're not living right, I'm not going to bless you so you can continue to live in your sin and think that God has got a plan for your life. God wants an everyday intimate relationship with you. Then, when you have this intimate relationship going on with God, then his favor and his blessings will follow your life. It don't mean the absence of challenges. Paul had plenty of challenges. But God said, my favor is still with you. And saints, I declare to you today through the word of God that God's promises are still the same today. That if you would abide in him, that if you would trust in him, he would bring you through. He would show his favor in your life. God doesn't tell you what tomorrow holds, what next week or next month or next year holds. God says, trust in me day by day, step by step, and I'll reveal to you what my plans for your life is. But the more you give yourself over to me, the more you're going to be directed in how your prayers are going to be or should be directed. You're going to find yourself less praying about what I want and more praying about kingdom stuff, more praying about God's will be done in your life. So when you ask in his name, these things happen. Please know there is favor of God. There is blessings of God waiting for you in your life. But God expects you to have a proper relationship going on with him. It's not just some you call my name and make a prayer and, and, and throw Jesus' name in there. And I look together, you're going to get what you want. Seek to have a relationship with God. So when the stress, when the trials, when you find yourself three days without a sun, without a stars, in a storm, floating. you got peace. And you're waiting on God to give you an answer on how to deal with it. When all those men were out there wondering how and when they were going to die, Paul was having quiet prayers. Paul was able to realize that an angel of God was sent and was by his side. And it was some tremendous peace. I guarantee you Paul was a humming some of them little songs. Okay? On Christ, the solid rock I stand. When everybody else was sniffling and, and crying and didn't know what to do, this is what happens when you've got a relationship with God. Favor will be yours. Trust in God. This is how we are going to get the blessings in our lives today. This is what God has laid on my heart. And I pray today that you would be encouraged to continue to give of your best to God. In a time when the world is looking to distract you, in a time when so much is going on, God just said, listen, I still love you. RJ, I've got a plan for your life that's going to make sense to you. Bye and bye. Hold on. Hold the line. Keep trusting me. No, it's not always going to be easy, but I'm with you. I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. And this is what we have to hold on to today, saints. In a changing world, that don't want to hear from God, we will hold the line and trust God. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how hard it is, we have favor and blessings whenever we keep our reliance on God. This is my message of hope. This is my prosperity message for us today as we go forward in this world. Trust in God. Favor and blessings are coming your way as you Give of your best to your master as you give of everything you have and keep your trust in him in Jesus' name. I said earlier that this Holy Spirit whispers and it calls and it's calling someone right now. I don't know who you are or where you are, but if you hear this voice of our Savior saying, come to Jesus, try Jesus. It's time for me to change my life. It's time for me to see what Jesus is really about. If this is where you are today, please repeat these words after me and come and experience the victory of having Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Father God, I realize that I am a sinner. Lord, I realize 
that I need you. Father, I hear your voice calling me. I realize that you died and you rose again, that my sins can be forgiven. I confess, God, all my sins. I repent and I invite you into my heart. Come into my heart, Jesus, as I put my trust in you, in Jesus' name. If this is what you have done, be assured Jesus has come into your heart, that you are saved. Continue to believe. Reach out to us by the numbers that will be on the screen so that we can continue to spiritually seed into your life and be of an encouragement. Just know that God is real and God has a plan, a perfect plan for your life and he will guide you through it. Those of us that know what it's like to be saved, those of us that are saved, if we're not where we should be, at any time we have the ability to just confess our sins as God to Jeremiah to tell them a manual ways. Refocus back to God. Rededicate your life to God right now and God will take you to the next level in your walk. This is what God has given me and I pray that God continues to give you revelation and understanding of his word as his word continues to come back to your spirits. May God bless you in the mighty name of Jesus.